Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid is one of the most beloved spy game series ever. But how does its portrayal of espionage measure up when compared to the real world? Let's find out. The MGS series contains grains of science fiction, manga, anime, and Hollywood films. It isn't trying to be as pseudo-realistic as something like Splinter Cell, but surprisingly, its actual espionage elements are incredibly faithful to the practices and even the overall spirit of spying in the real world. In 1998's Metal Gear Solid 1, just like Metal Gear games back on the MSX, before you can go about sabotaging the titular giant robot, you have to gather intelligence by contacting what are known in the real world as sources or assets. This process of obtaining so-called actionable intel from assets is known as human, human intelligence. It's been the foundation of spying for centuries. Now, Solid Snake isn't CIA, he's former Green Beret Special Forces. This elite cadre of commandos forms part of the US Army. They are never, unlike spies, sent in solo, but in teams. And when the Green Berets show up, usually it's after intel's been gathered. But as for the CIA, they do more than spying, actually. They also conduct covert and clandestine operations, and unbeknownst to some, the CIA, ever since the war in Laos during the mid-20th century, have built up a significant presence for themselves as a paramilitary outfit, too. So what do these words mean? Paramilitary means a military force outside the official or traditional military structure, not to mention the law. A covert op is deniable. It conceals the identity of who's doing it, but not the operation itself. A clandestine op, meanwhile, is hidden. It's totally secret. Solid Snake and MGS-1 is sent in to gather intel and conduct direct action, as in sabotage, against a terrorist enemy, paramilitary force. That makes him a fictional fusion between spy, counter-terrorist operator, and special forces commando. To track down the VIP hostages in MGS-1, as well as avoid being compromised by the enemy force, Snake relies on a different kind of intel, from human SIGINT, or signals intelligence. This form originated with the telecoms and eventual electronic revolutions of the 20th century, Though today, we live in the age of fiber optics and soon 5G wireless, at the time MGS-1 was made, most signals worked via satellite, phone lines, or radio. The game makes frequent reference to burst transmission, which is a form of broadcasting lots of data very quickly to avoid detection, and obtain what's known as LPI and LPR, low probability of intercept and low probability of recognition. Two things that are crucial for spies, of course. The SIGINT field of information gathering is closely associated with the NSA, short for America's National Security Agency. The DIA, or Defense Intelligence Agency, would also be frequently referenced by the MGS series. But the NSA wouldn't get directly referenced by MGS until the second game, Sons of Liberty. MGS 2 was even more detailed and true to life when it came to nods it would make to the real espionage world. Sons of Liberty was chiefly concerned with information warfare and psyops, psychological operations. It used espionage and infiltration to comment on human nature and the fallibility of perception, something fundamental to both espionage and its opposite, counterintelligence. Which at the end of the day, both are all about anticipating perceptions and subverting them. Or exposing the truth concealed within the lie. MGS2 would deceive the player ourselves by deploying disinformation. Misinformation is inaccurate, while disinformation lies not only about a piece of intel but where it came from. MGS2's shadowy cabal, the Patriots, not only lie to us, but use disinformation, conceal the channels used to get those lies to us. We see a wider breadth of SIGINT in Sons of Liberty, from COMMENT, Communications Intelligence, to ELINT and IMINT, Electronic and Image Intelligence. At one point, we listen in on intercepted transmissions from a team of Navy SEALs, while ELINT's part of a gameplay scenario that involves tracking down the signal emitted by Terrorist C4. The 
this falls under the banner of Massent, Measurement and Signature Intelligence, which is in turn part of Elint, Electronic Intelligence. Imint, meanwhile, we conduct ourselves as Snake by snapping photographic evidence of the secret project Metal Gear Ray. There's a nod to something called the NSDD, National Security Decision Directive, which American officials at the highest levels of the government, in the real world almost always exclusively the president, will sign in secret to authorize special covert and clandestine operations. And then there are some activities so secret not even the president may be deemed in the need to know. In MGS2, before getting access to map data, Raiden has to download it from a computer terminal in each area called a node. This infiltration within an adversary's closed computer network is itself a case of SIGINT. MGS2 would even feature small amounts of OSINT, open source intelligence. Raiden's support staff would often analyze data taken from public records and information pulled from online. Did the military database include information on the marine filtration facility structure as well? No, I didn't use the database. Huh? I used a brochure. MGS2 would wind up focusing on supercomputers and AI, which it turns out are important parts of the code breaking and data processing practiced by SIGINT organizations like the NSA. According to Jan Goldman's CIA Encyclopedia, today, quote, it is estimated that the NSA has advanced electronic equipment that's at least two generations beyond what is available on the commercial market, end quote. But both MGS-1 and 2 depict espionage in the post-Cold War age, largely as forms of counter-terrorism. It wasn't until MGS-3 Snake Eater that players got to experience some form of what spying was like in the good old days of East vs. West. Snake Eater may take its name from a nickname in the US military for special forces operators, and base a lot of its setting and gear around the Vietnam War that first brought the CIA into Laos from merely an intelligence agency into a paramilitary force. But its substance draws heavily from works by the master of Cold War spy fiction, John Le Carre. MGS3 is filled with nods to real-life spying in the Cold War and even World War II. For example, Snake is given currencies from several different neighboring countries in the region to throw off any potential captors. His suicide pill, concealed in his tooth, may be a nod to the Nazi Himmler and other spies and operators on both sides of both major wars who were given suicide tablets to take in case of a dire emergency. MGS-3 also gives a nod to the CIA division in charge of clandestine, covert, paramilitary sneaking missions, the Special Activities Division, which in 2016 became renamed as the Special Activities Center. In MGS-3, Zero belongs to a subdivision within the CIA called BCP, Bureau of Classified Planning, which not only refers to the SAD, but also happens to be a nod to BCP, Beyond Coast Police, from the game Police Knots. The character Eva would embody not only a clandestine operative, but a so-called honey trap, a tactic beloved by the Soviets to use sex to recruit an asset, meaning flip their loyalty to their side. MGS3 would also deal with deep cover agents, aka moles, a term made famous by Lakar. A mole is sent by a spy outfit to gain employment at an enemy facility directly, instead of a spy who tracks down and recruits assets who work there. Now, the main task in MGS games of sneaking into enemy facilities behind enemy lines isn't really part of espionage in such a literal sense. Kojima says this element for the game actually comes from hide-and-seek. The closest MGS came to reality on this subject was MGS3 and MGS-V, both of which modeled their approaches to penetrating territory not on spies, but survivalist paratroopers from the mother of all special forces units, aka SOFs, the SAS, formed as a British unit in World War II. If a spy does have to hide from the enemy, usually it's done as in one part of MGS3 by wearing a disguise while hiding in plain sight. By MGS4 Guns of the Patriots, the series would begin to showcase the real world transition from government to private intelligence and paramilitary companies. Outsourcing has become a huge part of the U.S. national intelligence budget. For example, 70% of the $80 billion earmarked in 2013. 
According to the Belfer Center of the Harvard Kennedy School, the IC, or intelligence community in America, rely on private companies for a host of reasons, chief among them the rights and protections that private companies have over government agencies. MGS4 was much more invested in depicting the state of war fighting and so-called total battlefield awareness in the present era, more than it was in intelligence or matters of espionage. The game would deal with things like encryption and access control, but actual spying took somewhat of a backseat. There were still examples of espionage in MGS4, in terms of covert identities, like how Snake starts off the game a secret assassin who operates undercover as a UN analyst. But MGS4 focused more on espionage and subterfuge by private companies, from gun laundering to tax havens. Peace Walker, meanwhile, brought things back to the Cold War, this time into a region and era where few Americans realized the CIA and KGB were heavily involved, Latin America in the 1970s. Peace Walker would cover everything from proxy wars to the rise of SIGINT, armed revolutions, double agents, and yes, even more, psychological warfare. The subject of smaller countries having their fates decided by unelected intelligence agencies from superpowers sent beyond their borders would begin to be covered here before blossoming into a central topic for the last two true Metal Gear games, Ground Zeroes and The Phantom Pain. But with these last two games, arguably MGS truly entered a phase of excellence as espionage fiction few others in this genre can compare to. The reason for this is MGS-V, as it's called, would directly integrate into its storytelling as well as its gameplay the concept called by famous spy James Jesus Angleton, the Wilderness of Mirrors. It's a concept that's been part of MGS from the start, from the reveal you were actually helping Foxhound arm their nuke instead of disarming it in MGS1, to the discovery everything in MGS2 was staged as a kind of warped psychology experiment by the Patriots, to the reveal that the boss at MGS3 was actually always loyal to the US and let herself die a dishonorable death to save the world. But in all these examples from the series, the truth inevitably got revealed. The distinction between perception and reality was eventually explained. Not so for MGSV. In the V-Class games, the player would experience firsthand the principle in intelligence that all intel must be analyzed after it's gathered, and even then you may never know the truth of things for sure. Telling apart enemy from friend or truth from lie isn't always 100% possible in the spy world. MGSV showcased this unknowability beautifully while making the jobs of intel gathering and analysis not only integral parts of the game, but part of a communal metagame experience that brought fans together around the world to form many virtual intelligence cells of our own. MGSV is like a never-ending tapestry of possible interpretations and fake identities that illustrates the whirlwind of the wilderness of mirrors in matters of espionage and intelligence like no creative work before it or maybe since. All in all, the MGS series, despite being always larger than life, stayed wonderfully true to the principles and facets of intelligence and counterintelligence. It approaches the subject in a detail-oriented way and makes spying, information gathering, and infiltration interactive affairs. For these reasons, MGS will endure as perhaps the greatest spy series of all time. Until next time, boss.